Welcome back to another episode of the We Live to Build podcast. Our guest today is Eric Varden, a Canadian serial entrepreneur and currently the co-founder of Morpheo, the world's first advanced marketing security software. He's also an investor in and advisor of Event Connect, a tournament software solution platform that lets event organizers coordinate teams, hotels, and revenue. He's also an investor and advisor of Republics, which connects businesses to marketing agencies with guaranteed results. He's also the co-founder and former CEO and president of Arcane, a digital goals-first marketing agency. Please note that this business was acquired for eight figures in early 2020. In this great talk, Eric and I discuss who inspired him to become an entrepreneur, how clients' mindset shifting forced our businesses to move to showing value and transparency, why he never raised outside funding for his companies, how he decided to step back as CEO and hire someone to run day-to-day for Arcane, what the process for selling the business was like, was he satisfied with the amount he earned from the exit, I talk about why blockchain and Bitcoin are so hot at the end of 2020, and much more. So let's give Eric a warm welcome. Welcome to We Live to Build. My name is Sean Weisbrot, and I'm an entrepreneur, investor, and advisor based in Asia for over 12 years. Join us every week to fast track your personal growth so you can meet the ever-increasing demands of the company or companies you are passionately building. Time waits for no one, so let's get started now. Thank you for taking the time to talk with us. And I'm really excited to hear more about your story. So let's tell everyone real fast just what you're doing right now. Yep. Right now, uh, leading a, a, a software team uh, on a product called Morpheo. Uh, it's a, an AI software for digital marketing teams to help them uh, save time, be awesome, and enjoy their uh, enjoy their hours every day. Thanks for the quick introduction. And we'll talk a little bit more about that company as we go through your your journey. So let's go a bit further back and tell me when you knew that entrepreneurship was your path in life and who inspired you to go along that path? Yeah, I I, I get asked this question a lot and funny that it it wasn't something that I knew uh, until much later in in my life. Um, I I have uh, had a grandpa, unfortunately, he he passed uh, a number of years back, but he uh, he was an entrepreneur and I didn't really know what that meant, but he was always out, big family, you know, eight eight kids, so on my mom's side, uh, always out uh, some kind of new business and some kind of new uh, opportunity. And so I think I, you know, maybe overheard a lot of that going on as uh, my mother was the oldest of the family, I was then the oldest grandson or grandkid at the time. So I, I think there's a lot that came from uh, from that. But I had always been really good at one thing, which was not listening well. So, uh, so when I was playing sports, or when I got into school, and and then ultimately got into the world of, of marketing, advertising, technology, um, had a, a job out of out of school, out of college, and uh, once again, I was just not really good at listening to my boss at the time, and so decided to start a business, and you know, figured why not? Uh, this was at you know the late late nineties, early two thousands, if you can uh, if you can remember back that far. You know the whole uh, the whole dot com bubble was going on, but it was a great time to be in the business of, of building websites, etc. And so from there, I, I never really stopped. Jumped into many many different types of businesses, uh, into banking machines and building random technology to you know clothing and retail, and it always had a central uh, uh, theme of of marketing technology uh, with it, which is of course what I'm still into today. But it wasn't until a few years ago when I was speaking to somebody actually um, on a random sort of LinkedIn reach out phone call and, and she talked about her entrepreneurial journey and, and uh, gleaned it to her her sports uh, background and, and uh, you know, her leadership style. And, and she felt that that's where uh, she drew a lot of her um, uh, entrepreneurial feelings and, and, and wants was, was from sports and wanting to lead and be a part of a team, building team and, and living in that environment, but as the leader, really taking it to a different level. So 
I think there's a combination of answers there, Sean. That's kind of how I usually get into it. But it was a number of different things. Um, but it re- I really didn't set out to be an entrepreneur. But like I said, terrible at listening. Whether it was right or wrong, it, it worked out for me, I think. so. Thanks for sharing that. I know my grandfather was always enterprising. I remember he was always thinking of the next thing, trying to get my parents involved. I'm pretty sure some of them were uh, multi-level marketing schemes. I don't know. So maybe he wasn't the uh, cleanest kind of entrepreneur, but he, he made money in his own right. He is a classic hustler. He actually did door-to-door chemical sales for a company called Zep for, I think, 35 years. And he was doing, in in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, he was clearing $100,000 a year, which most people were doing like six, seven, eight, nine thousand $9,000 a year at that point, uh, especially towards the 50s. Earlier on in his life, he was definitely hustling, uh, as we would say, balls to the wall and doing quite well with it. I guess I never had a problem listening, but I also always had too much energy and my bosses never understood how to utilize it properly. And I felt like only I could do that. As you were working in the dot-com era and all of that, how did you decide to make this marketing agency that you then had this uh, fabulous exit from? Yes, yeah, so it was actually before. That's my first, uh, my the first agency that I I ran was with some friends out of school. So we were all we were all taking you know web development and 3D and video and you know at the time Flash was still a big thing and we jumped in right away. The the three of us basically with a bunch of friends and contractors and and really grew that business. So at the time, you know, agencies there was a lot of really big agencies. That was the theme. It always kind of ebbs and flows. And so our our job basically as contractors was to work with the big agencies. And, and so we were kind of in the background and, uh, you know, it was, it was, a, it was a great time to, to, to go through that, that ride. Um, but with my partners and I, we had difference of opinion of where we felt the market was, was going. We were building a lot of custom content managements at the time. And then this thing called WordPress came out and, um, you know, it was, it, it was quite a disruptor for a lot of us in, in terms of open source and, and where all that went. And, and so we just ultimately went our separate ways. And, and that's when I founded, uh, arcane with my with my business partner john and ultimately our goal was this so this was at uh, just after the 2008 2009 recession uh 2010 things started to come back on but clients all over were asking for transparency on on where their marketing dollars were going and and that was a big change and so before building websites and doing all that thing it was you know here's a budget go do it launch it great then, you know, with analytics and with SEO and with the ability to, to track and launch campaigns and, and really measure everything, we were one of the first to really put that emphasis out there and say, we're going to guarantee results. We're going to put a dollar in and get a minimum of $15, you know, back in terms of uh, your marketing investment. And that was in 2011. And, and we grew that, like I said, for uh, about eight years and, and just recently sold to uh, to, to focus and run, uh, run Morpheal. I'm curious to know how that transparency affected your profit margins because uh, the the last business I did was in consulting and blockchain. And when I was up front with the companies about how much I was taking for my commission, they didn't like it because it was a very large number. But when I stopped telling them the breakdown and I started saying, if you want this thing to happen, this is how much it costs. Because I was also doing introductions and, and using some of that money with other people. So I would give a commission to this person because they referred them and I would pay for whatever you know thing that I was doing. When I stopped being transparent with them, they were okay with that number and they didn't know how much commission I was taking because they were paying for the value I was bringing and therefore whatever the commission I wanted it to be was was what it was. Obviously, in your regard it would be slightly different. So I'm curious to know how that transparency affected your profits. Yeah, it was, um, it's, and it's not too dissimilar to that where it became value-based and, uh, you know, and, and of course, you know, it's a service, it's people that are driving the, the back end of, uh, of whatever it is that we were building or launching or creating. Um, and so often we wouldn't get into margin conversations with clients. We knew we would be profitable. Uh, we knew that we had to obviously monitor our, our cash flow and expenses and all those fun things that, that lead to it. But no, it was mainly around results. We focused on results. We sold results. And as long as our clients knew that that return and that level of service and quality was there and that they were happy with it, that's really where the most of uh, the majority of our conversations led on. So uh, I think as we grew up and got a bit wiser, uh, to your point, Sean, we became more transparent and clear on how we make money and, and you know how service agencies work and all those kinds of things. But it was only to a select few uh, amount of partners. Ultimately, it was solely around, let's take your dollars that currently aren't doing anything or, or little, 
or they might be doing something, but you're not tracking. And let's start to create visibility and transparency, not only on our relationship, but what it is that your dollars are doing. And that became very addictive, again, at a time where it was, uh, wasn't was as easy to to be able to create and establish and track and, and monitor everything that was going on through, through digital marketing or campaigns. So that really was the focus, more on the outcome, the results. Uh, as opposed to how we made money as a as an agency, they were more than comfortable with uh, with that. As long as you get results, everybody usually is happy. Before we started recording, I think you mentioned something about starting this company out of the basement of your house. Yep, that's right. Second time, second time doing it. <laughs> so you bootstrapped this company to profit, never got outside funding. That's right, o- always. And I think that's up until you know what we are doing with with Morpheo and more product related businesses on a service side. When you when you are a founder, most often you can you get a computer, you have expertise, you need a little bit of expenses, but you should be able to turn uh, revenue and or, or cash flow around pretty, pretty quickly. And that's what we had done before. And, you know, again, being a little bit older and wiser, we, we, we knew how important it was to, to go out there and prove that we had something to sell. And that's really how we started. I think we just got lucky enough through it where we were, we had something really uh, important uh, and, and timely to sell. And yeah, we, we really never needed outside funding whatsoever. So it's interesting you say that. I recently interviewed a, a guy who, uh, his name is Stephen Halaznik, and he started and grew six companies from scratch, uh, bootstrapped them all to profit, never got outside funding. And we were talking about how my generation, I guess in particular, uh, were millennials really, have felt that the only route to success in entrepreneurship is VC funding. Um, and so he he was saying how, like, it's basically not how your generation really did it. And I think it's great. I think there's a huge reliance on outside funding now that's detrimental for the development of businesses in a sustainable way uh, because VCs, if they haven't been entrepreneurs themselves, may not understand how stressful it can be to grow that fast for long periods of time. I'll say it's a generational thing. I'll I'll take that because I do have more gray hair than you, Sean. You know, I've been down the journey of both. You know, a great book is uh, Rand Fishkin's Lost and Founder. He he tells a great story of, of founding Moz and uh, some of the things that he went through and, and what he did do and what he didn't do. So I, I'd recommend everybody, you know, take a listen through his journey. It was very similar to mine in many cases. And I resonated with a lot that uh, that he said. So being in, in, through both and understanding, you know, the, both sides of the world, there is a need depending on the type of product and the type of business that you're in. Any good investor is going to want to make sure that you have proven your business first and you've grinded and you've sweated out and that you know the product, you know there's a fit, the market timing is right. There's a lot of factors that go into it. And I'm not talking about you know friends and family money they are going to give it to you because they trust who you are. Uh, I'm talking about real dollars as you need to scale and you need to throw the kind of gas on the fire to, to really get to the next level. That's where funding is meant to be. There's definitely, with social media, I'll say just in the access to stories and success that are gleamingly or seemingly, sorry, overnight, uh, uh, you know, billionaires. Well, that it usually behind the scenes, there's a, a lot more of a story there that needs to be told. Raising money is very hard. There's a lot of noise around it. It can take a lot of time, a lot of energy, and a lot of distraction away from the business that you, you know, should be growing. So, like I said, depending on the business, service versus product, timing versus technology and, and all those kinds of things factor into it. Um, it you really got to understand what it is, the outcome that you're looking for, for the business. But when you get partners, when you get investors, you know, you're truly accountable to somebody else and, and you have to answer to somebody else. I wasn't or never really wanted to do that. As I said before, not great at listening. Uh, and I had great partners, so I didn't have to worry about that. And it, and it was never a part of the decision making process in my mind. When you get into answering to somebody else, everything that you do has to boil up to your board or your investor group. That is a that is a very different way of living. So it may seem, uh, again, glamorous in some respect, or that there's a whole bunch of money floating around. But again, if you look at Rand's examples in his in his book, you know it doesn't always work out. And there's there's a lot of information there around exactly what VCs or private equity or you know, family offices, they're all different. They're all different criteria, what it is that they're looking for. So if you are going down the raise money route, just, you know, be careful what you're getting into and be be focused and understand all the, of your options. Because the best way definitely is to never need money if you can. Absolutely. And let me clarify that there are amazing humans and unbelievable investors and, and you can get lucky. And, and, you know, we have in a couple of businesses that we're involved in, we have unbelievable investor groups and they do exist. And, and so, the last part is, and I, and I kind of forgot to mention is, and not to poo-poo anything in the world of investment, but 
make sure that you're trusting your instinct and just don't take the first people that, you know, throw money at you. You really are going to spend a lot of time with them. You're going to be accountable to them and you need to really like each other. And that's a, that's a, a big trust factor when it comes into not only the dollars, but the long term relationship that it is that you're going to have with them. Cause you're going to, you're going to need it. So just one other point I wanted to touch on, John. How did you grow the marketing agency, especially during this time you said when it was in the middle of the crisis and the great recession and all of that, people probably weren't spending that much. How did you find these clients? How did you grow the company through all that? Yeah, I think with with any good business, it's looking for opportunities to not have to add budget. Um, and so we were cognizant, exactly as you said, you know, 2010, things started to pick up. There's a little bit of dollars floating after after 2008 and nine. Uh, but people really were holding on to their uh, in, uh, onto their cash or to their to their budgets. Um, so first foremost, yeah, we didn't want to add to the budget. Uh, we wanted to to prove and show results, which at the time was very different. It was a unique sales conversation that traditionally that they would never have had. Uh, generally, it was before just spend a bunch of money and and let's see what happens next year from a historical report perspective. And we walk in and say, you know, we're going to show you results every single week that we meet with you and we're going to meet in person and we're going to sit down and we're going to teach you and coach you just as much as you are on your business. We're going to do the same about what's going on with your data and what it is that your analytics are and performance are are telling us. So that was a big point. The second one in terms of budget was we uh, we wanted to take dollars from existing budget from something else that we would be able to to show wasn't working. Uh, so in a lot of cases, it was a traditional media focus. So we'd actually go out and find clients that are spending on radio or billboards or newsletters or um, newspapers or flyers or something, you know, kind of old school and say, okay, if you're spending a million dollars on all these things, let's just take $100,000 of that and put it into our project. So it's not new money, but we're going to start to sh- slowly show them return. And so we did that. And we had a couple of big clients sign up with us right away and they had massive budgets. And, uh, and all we did was show results. And so more and more of that percentage of the hundred or the million dollar budget came over to our business. So when you do that and you compound new business at the same time, and so we had the split focus of growing our amazing accounts, as well as uh, finding, you know, and establishing new relationships, that's really where the scale came in. And that's how we were, you know, be able to, to become one of the fastest growing businesses in North America for, for a couple of years running was results focused and ultimately doing what we said we were going to do in a world where most often you have no idea what's going on, at least traditionally. So that's how we did it. That's a fantastic strategy. Uh, I've never heard of anyone sitting you down and explaining your data. Like, as you said, I've, I've talked to so many different companies and I still don't think people are doing that kind of stuff. So let's move a little bit further to more about the sale of the agency. So did you decide you were ready to sell or did someone come to you and say, I like this, I want to buy it from you? So we've had lots of people interested in, in the business and, um, or co-investing and growing and all those kinds of things. And again, we had a, we had a seven-year business plan that you know, we sat down and, and looked at together. In around uh, 2017, my co-founder and I and our partners, we, we realized that we loved building the business and selling and you know, being a part of the grind of the strategy and the product and all those kinds of things. What we weren't great at was, you know, let's say, running the actual operations, the day-to-day, the HR, the process, the you know, executive team meetings, et cetera, et cetera. That's not what got us excited in the morning. So we actually stepped aside. Uh, I was CEO for, for the majority of the, of the time. I, I moved uh, over. To, uh, to basically a chairman and, and president role. And we appointed a new CEO and a COO to come in and, and run the business. It was our sort of first inkling that, you know, how long are we going to be involved in this business? But we, we loved it. We loved the culture. We loved the team. We loved the clients. And so we didn't want to go anywhere. We just didn't know what our next evolution was. But we did have a realization that we weren't the, the long-term you know, managers of, of the business day to day. And so we were very happy about that change and that movement. Uh, and the team is still intact today. Both Dave and Lindsay are unbelievable leaders. Uh, and they went through with the acquisition and are still leading and running the business. Partly to do with that was we also were smart to know in a relationship-based business, if all of the clients are attached to the owners, that it's hard to ever get out of the business. And it, it, we also felt that it would add more value if those relationships were tied to the business, not to ourselves. And so that was part of the reasoning as well. We felt that if we ever did 
sell the business one day, whether it was in a year or 10 years or 15 years, that that would add to our, our valuation and, and also make it easier to, to separate ourselves from. Best decision we ever made, the business was never more profitable until we actually got out of the way. And it was a really kind of interesting moment in time as we reflected back to say, holy crap, that uh, we should have done this you know, a lot longer ago. Fast forward a couple of years later and the business is profitable and we're making good money. And you know, we are serial entrepreneurs. We have other businesses on the go always. Um, there's always something else that we're involved in or that we had going on. And Morphia was, you know, part of that as well as a couple other uh, businesses. One was called, uh, it's called Event Connect as well in the sports and travel space. And what was cool about that is we sat down as owners and said, okay, what do we really want to do now? And, and we wanted to, we've set our goals and criteria. And, but we also said, we're going to go out and see what's going on in the market because at the still, this was obviously pre COVID. It was, the market was crazy. It was going well, the business was profitable, but let's see what's going on in the market for our business. And it just so happened that I have a friend in the MA space. We had a call, set up a call a couple of weeks after that meeting with our, our ownership group and said, here's our, here's our wants, protect our team, protect our clients, you know, our, our leadership. Uh, our culture, our brand, we'd, we'd really love for all these things to stay intact. And it was an hour after that meeting with our, our M&A firm to say, okay, go out there and see what's going on in the market that I got a random LinkedIn message from now our, uh, our partners that acquired our business saying, here's this idea that we have, here's what we're doing uh, in the space. We'd love for you to be a part of it. We'd love to buy your business. Uh, but we'd also love for you to be uh, around as advisors in this new, the, the new parent company. They met all of our criteria. It was just a random timing kind of coincidence that it happened uh, without us actually going around and needing to, to shop the business. So that was a, a year, about a year and a bit ago uh, last year. Sorry. Um, so like I said, it was timing and timing is a big thing in, in, in my world and my brain. And, and a lot of us share that at the ownership level. But so it was, yes, we, we were interested to seeing what was out there. And it just ironically or coincidentally, somebody knocked on our door with with most of the criteria that we're looking at almost momentarily after that uh, that decision. How long was it from when they messaged you to when you actually closed? And what was the process like of, I guess you had to go through due diligence. They probably asked for tons of documents. Uh, what is that like? Because I think a lot of people love to know, oh, you made a hundred million dollars, but nobody talks about the process of the sale, the close. The money part is interesting because it you get you can get stuck on that very quickly and, and um, it, it can drive negative decisions. So we're lucky where we we hired a, the, uh, the M&A firm to actually guide us through the process. We had been on the buying side before but not on the, the selling side, especially with a business of that size. And, and I can show you a clip of the paperwork on the day we signed. It was littered our second floor of our entire, uh, entire office. And funny, one of our, this was actually during COVID, one of our team members walked in to water the plants and they're, they're like looking around because they had no idea what was going on. And there's, you know, 20 people running around and lawyers and papers being signed. And it was, it was insanity. But yeah, it was. So from November of 2019, um, moved very quickly, closing at the end of, of March is not a lot of time. So it was weekends, nights, mornings, days, ridiculous amount of due diligence. Um, the process is, is, is not simple, but I'll, I'll simplify it. It's in most cases, there's you know, the process to a letter of intent, which is generally non-binding, but the letter of intent speaks to multiples, valuations, um, the, the requirements to get to a specific deal structure. So we spend a lot of time within the LOI stage uh, with our, um, you know, with the, the potential buyers, getting to know them, et cetera. Again, trying to make sure that you're not disclosing too much to, a, to the wider team because you never know if it's really going to happen and you don't want to disrupt the business because ultimately everybody needs to make sure that the business is still you know, running and managing. But behind the scenes, it was um, a, a ton of paperwork, a ton of back and forth, go through that LOI stage, and then you really get into the due diligence, which leads to your definitive agreement. And the definitive agreement then is ultimately where there's no point of return backwards. But leading from the LOI to the definitive agreement you know, was insane. You've got, you know, a business that is, you know, it's only 10 or nine years old, I guess. Uh, but you have contract renewals, you have bank statements, you have, I mean, I, I'm, I'm completely generalizing it, but it's a long, long list of things that, you know, our group needed to do. That part's easy. It's the emotional 
roller coaster that goes with it. Is this going to happen? Is this not going to happen? And the deal structure needed to change and then the people and all this kind of like, it is very emotionally taxing, you know, took a lot out of me. And I, I led a lot of this with John and, and a few other key people. We narrowed the team focused on it because with too many kind of cooks in the kitchen, it can be even that much more of a distraction. So we we went on the guidance of our m a partners and they kind of led us through it. This may be another conversation, but then there's the the reality that you have sold the business, you know, even though we were lucky where we we're still involved and a lot of things that we wanted were still intact. There's like the six steps of, uh, of emotional roller coaster that happen after you, you let your baby go. And even though I thought I was mentally prepared for that, I'd already stepped away as a CEO. I wasn't leading the business. I wasn't as attached to every single person in the, in, in the business and was, uh, you know, busy doing some other stuff. It, it still hit me, you know, pretty hard. And it took a good six months for me to like, you know, kind of get through it all uh, inside of the COVID madness that, you know, that was happening at the same time. So anyway, a lot of great things that happened to it, but yeah, I, I'm happy to, to, to show you that recording of the paperwork because it was, uh, I look at it all the time. I'm like, my God, what were we, what were we doing? <laughs> at the end of the day, through all of it, through all the, 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 the huge roller coaster you experienced, would you say that you were satisfied with the sale and with the amount of money that you made? Yeah, absolutely. It was, you know, not to get into too many details of our criteria, but uh, a lot of it was we have these fantastic uh, initiatives and other businesses going on that, that ultimately have uh, a, a very large upside to them, in, in many cases more than you know, what the service-based business did. And, and it was our time to kind of move on. And, uh, and and so we're very happy with the deal structure. We love our new partners. You know, we're so happy with the success of that business and being able to be involved in it and meeting all of our criteria just means that much more that we made the right decision. Um, and obviously some bumps and bruises al along the way itself, but ultimately what has happened with COVID in the world of digital and marketing and commerce, e-commerce formally, whatever you want to call it, um, has just supercharged our entire our business and in, in the business of being all things online. So um, that means a lot to us. It means the business is secure and we've got a, a, a great model and the team there is doing awesome. And, and that, you know, it all boils up to we made the right decision. And so very happy with how everything went down, you know, outside of the stress, et cetera. We've got great partners. We've got a great business uh, and to be a part of something that is really going to grow and, uh, and, you know, change the, the landscape of marketing and being a part of that is, is super exciting. So yeah, very happy. Well, I'm glad to hear, I've heard of a lot of, uh, negatives. So it's nice to hear someone who has something good to say about the experience. You decided to start Morpheo after you stepped away as CEO, but before you sold the agency, is that right? Did you decide to step away as CEO in order to start Morpheo? Or did you just come up with the idea after? Like, talk about that that process. Yeah, me mentally, as I said before, we in gut instinct always knew building stuff was what gets us up in the morning, gets me up in the morning. And the chaos of trying to figure out the strategy and, and answer the problem is, you know, is is what I love to do. So I think mentally or internally, it was twofold. Like I said before, it was the right thing to do for the business because the business needed the team to focus on the individuals, right? Ultimately service-based company with a lot of young, amazing individuals that are the ones creating all of the assets that come out of our business every single day. Um, and that's why Lindsay was appointed CEO is because she comes from that world of human capital. She knows how to coach and, and educate and, te and take a team and really amplify their, you know, their successes, show their career path, et cetera. Uh, and the same with with Bunts from an operations perspective, taking you know the finance and taking the the, the leadership through our processes and in creating processes that you know can scale. Not something that you know I'm good at or or want to do. Um, so it was really a concurrent kind of decision. And like I said, attaching the value to the company versus the people. I think I needed something to, else to focus on at the same time. And so as a marketer and, a, and a sort of a, a tech nerd, etc., you know, we we looked at our own data as we did with our clients and said, okay, why aren't we scaling as well as we want to? Where why are there efficiencies or why are there mistakes that are happening? You know, why is our team so busy running around, tired, burnt out? They're not doing the things that we've hired them to do. And that's ultimately, you know, where Morpheo came from. And, and it was um, the mistakes that led up to all of those factors that created an unhappy, you know, workforce in many, in many cases. So the interesting part, it wasn't one thing that was impacting our margins. It was a whole bunch of things in, in a minute percentage. So it was, you know, too much analysis through 
analytics and spending too much time on the data, pulling reports and then making decisions. So we're like, why can't we have data that goes to help them just make the decision and prioritize uh, to reporting? You know, we're spending all these time across hundreds of clients developing um, you know, PDFs to send over that nobody's going to read. Why can't we automate that? And so on and so forth. So we looked at the parts of the business internally that any marketing team faces and says, how can we make their lives way more awesome, free them up from the stuff that they don't want to do and put automation uh, where it needs to be on the repetitive and the mundane parts of uh, a digital marketer's workflow. And that's where Morpheo kind of came into play. I love that. I was actually talking to a guy named Frank Ulschlager. He has a business that helps large companies digitize and automate. And so we were talking about what is automation and what kinds of automations can you apply very simply to your business in order to move yourself in this direction. And I'm a very firm believer of automation. I believe that Automation should eat your company. That was actually the name of the title of the episode. I love that you found problems in your original company that led to a potential solution in the new company. And I think that it's it's a really interesting idea and I'm sure it'll be very successful. Being able to automate parts of what we do will be an ever increasing theme over the next two decades for sure, where I'm a firm believer that artificial intelligence will end up processing a lot of the ideas and data and making it so that the human just says, okay, let's do this. The, the human will probably be the one making the decision, but be heavily guided by information from artificial intelligence. So you're definitely headed in the right direction with that idea. There's definitely people that are skeptical and, and rightfully so in, in many cases in terms of what automation is going to re replace my job, et cetera. And you know, our mission statement is to, to make marketers um, you know, more happy and awesome and free them from the stuff that they don't want to do. It, it just makes sense. I mean, none of us want to sit there and do the same task over and over and over if we don't have to. I mean, it, it, it sounds oversimplified, I guess, but you know, you're right. There is a place for automation. You know, I always reference Burger King's sort of fake AI commercials that they did that uh, if you haven't seen them, just Google them and, and take a look. But you're right. It, we need we need to free ourselves up to do what we do best, which is creative problem solving, decision making, et cetera. And we've got stuck in this busy, be, being busy is okay and being busy is fine and being busy is good. Um, it's, it's not. And uh, I, I, I can see now the, the outcome of what our software does for marketing teams, which is, you know, it allows them to think creatively and be free in terms of their imagination. That's the power of of what uh, in our space from from a marketing perspective, what what we can do as humans, we need more time to do it. So we've got to employ automation and, and have more fun. So I think what people should be worried about is not that automation will will take over their job, but that if they can't learn to work with artificial intelligence to make better decisions quickly, that they'll be replaced by younger people who can. Yeah, because their 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 mindset isn't a decision of one or the other. It's already, well, of course, I'm not going to do it that way. It's, it's, it's in talking to a lot of, uh, you know, digital marketing teams, the younger ones are fascinating because they are so technically smart. You know, they understand everything and they are so fast at how they make decisions. There isn't uh, it's not about even the price or it's that, or, or, you know, am I going to change? I'm so used to my, this or my, my clients are doing that way. It's, they want to know how it works. They want to understand, you know, why our algorithm is proven. They want to know um, that we understand, uh, in, in are going to be around a long time to be able to invest, you know, their, their time, their dollars and their team into the business. Uh, very different conversations that we even had even a year ago uh, around more of the, the, the pain points of changing my team and all that kind of stuff. They are, you know, the younger audience is fast forwarding to proof of algorithm. I'm going to try this. I'm going to use it. And then uh, we'll put the, put your money where their mouth is and, and get going. So it's a, it is a different world for sure. Yeah. I absolutely love working with other millennials. No offense to, to people of the older persuasion. Talking to people that are older than you gives you a tremendous amount of insight from their experience. And I think that, you know, it's very important to have relationships with people who are older than you, but also people that are younger than you are scary sometimes because you don't understand them. But millennials and Gen Z are driving a massive shift in the way business gets done. And I've, I've been more vocal about this uh, recently because working with millennials and Gen Z is really forcing businesses to change. And I think that that will also accelerate as artificial intelligence becomes stronger. Um, over time. Let me just make sure people don't think I'm too old. Okay, Sean, because you can't, <laughs> I'm, I was born in 77, which means I'm like my, at three or four years off of like the tip of the millennial side. I'm not saying I'm a millennial. 
Uh, but I represent actually an interesting small group of people born uh, in a time frame where I also had computers pretty much, and again, they're very old computers, very different than maybe ones you had. Uh, but I also was able to play around, uh, you know, with, with computers at a very young age. Again, there was 64 bit processors and stuff. So very slow. I have worked with an entire young workforce most of well, most of my life, especially through, uh, through Arcane, the business. And I completely re- re- uh, respect and, and understand the, the power and the passion and the transparency and the trust that I will say your generation, I keep feeling really old with the way we're chatting about this, Sean, but, um, you know, but it, it does represent, uh, to me, a fantastic positive shift in, in conversations that have not been able to, uh, have been had for many generations previous. So I will say, you know, thank you to that and making us, uh, older folk, I'll say, uh, transparent and have the conversations that we need to have, whether it's business or not. So take that for what it is, but hopefully you guys can fix all of the the stuff that's going on right now too. So not to put that on you, but I'm going to, (laughs) I know you're not that old. I mean, I I was born in 1986. If it's, if it means anything, I sometimes feel like I'm not a millennial and sometimes I feel like I am. And it's funny because I was having this conversation with someone years ago where they're like, well, millennials are like this. And I was like, damn it. I kind of, I get it. Like it makes sense. You know, I'm a very minimalistic person. I'm very open with my, uh, my lifestyle, my experiences, my, I'm I'm humble, uh, you know, about uh, the things I've been through. I'm very willing to talk about these things. And I, I have a very strong emphasis with my team on making sure they take care of themselves. And I talk to them about stress and anxiety and mental health. And I talk to them about my stress and, and issues that I go through as well, so that we have a very blunt relationship with each other and they really appreciate that and so um, I definitely think that it's it's important to have those kinds of things and uh, I know my dad's generation definitely doesn't talk about those I mean my my dad talks about them with me but like he's not going to go to his boss and talk to him about those things anyways what's a question I didn't ask you that you you wish I would ask I mean you're a blockchain guy I'd love to know your thoughts on on the recent uh, growth of, of Bitcoin, but maybe that's a whole nother conversation and your views on, you know, what, where custodian technology plays, but you know, we can save that for another time. So <laughs> I'm happy to share. It's no big deal. So I've been involved in the blockchain industry since the end of 2015. So we're coming on five years now. What I saw in 2015, 2016, 2017 was a crazy almost disgusting greed in the initial coin offering market. So this is less of blockchain and more in the cryptocurrency side. And people's greed destroyed them for a lot of them. And a lot of people who were innocent and just wanted to get involved in something interesting got taken very hard by uh, those people who were whales, uh, as they say. And so the market crashed pretty hard. We had a crypto winter that lasted until about... I would say a year ago. And the reason why we're seeing such a surge in Bitcoin in particular is several reasons. One, you're seeing on the blockchain side, a lot of governments talking about utilizing blockchain in their own uh, systems, like for example, birth certificates or health records or these kinds of things. You're also hearing governments and federal reserves around the world talking about central bank digital currencies, which is basically like a Bitcoin that is created by the government and will replace uh, paper currencies, which we call fiat currencies. So this this talk about the use of blockchain and these central bank digital currencies, uh, to make one point, is getting more people around the world to know that cryptocurrencies exist. And this is driving interest. Another factor in the growth of Bitcoin and Ethereum and these other cryptocurrencies recently is that a lot of institutional investors like Grayscale, I think they're called, as well as Jack Dorsey, who owns Square um, and PayPal, for example, they have become very vocal about including Bitcoin in their services, as well as purchasing Bitcoin on behalf of potential users who would buy and sell it. So we're seeing a massive demand in the purchasing of Bitcoin for these uh, professional services, as well as business to business services, as well as the purchasing of Bitcoin for hedge funds and other investors. And so this 
surge in popularity due to the surge in buying and discussion is really what's driving the growth of, of Bitcoin. So what is the most important thing you've learned in your life that you could impart on us? Whew. Well, I, uh, I think it has to be with, um, you know, how we, we treat each other. There's no better time to speak about this, but um, I have a personal belief to never judge anybody and to be empathetic with who they are, what they've been through, get to know and understand them. Uh, and then formulate a, a, a decision on what I, I believe, you know, who they are. And uh, I also trust my instinct and, and will often measure up uh, what I believe a person has to offer, and but also give them the benefit of the doubt in, in time and try to get to know them before before that. You know, you also never know who you're going to run into. I've had many relationships for many years, friends that turn into to co-workers and friends that turn into clients and, and vice versa and, and or partners and all sorts of stuff. It, it, the world is very small. And, uh, and I think if we treat each other with respect and, and empathy, then, you know, we'll have a better place to live. And like I said, there's no better time for us to understand each other's views, whether we believe it's right or wrong, actually listen to people, have conversations, take it off of Facebook or whatever social media that you want to, you know, position your, your point of power on. Not saying you shouldn't deliver it, but if people want to have a conversation or, or talk about their views, I think everybody needs to be a little bit more empathetic these days. Got to try to bring it all closer together. I've, I've learned the hard way that sometimes, you know, you, uh, things will come back and, and bite you. So just may, remember the world is very small. Treat each other with, uh, with kindness and, you know, hopefully we'll get through all this madness. I can definitely appreciate that sentiment. And it's it's actually really sad that you have to even say it. Well, it's it's tough to be empathetic when you have glass and a mask in front of you. As I was listening to, uh, as old people do, o old music, I was listening to a Kiss song called We're Not Gonna Take It this morning that popped onto my uh, uh, Sirius satellite. So I think if there's any theme right now for your generation that hopefully can save us all, uh, just play that, uh, that Kiss track. We're not gonna take it over and over. And please, yeah. Don't take anything. Let's let's change all this stuff and get things back to where they need to be. What's something really important that's close to your heart that you think people should know about, whether it's uh, a book or a podcast or a blog or whatever, or anything for you personally or about somebody else? This is your moment to, to share that. Well, I mean, I think the biggest the biggest issues with young kids that I, I face is, you know, it, it comes into food. And our ability to uh, be, we're lucky now to have a, an amazing amount of wonderful, nutritious, organic food. So in going through this in my own life is I, I didn't treat myself as well as I needed to. And now I eat a lot healthier. I focus on my, not only my health, my fitness and my mind, especially in business, you have to keep it sharp. But I think if, uh, and, I, and I believe your generation is more aware than, than any, but there's a, a limited time frame with the amount of nutritious soil that we have to actually grow these wonderful things we call fruit and vegetables and, and food, you know, so let's, let's take care of our planet. It's something that uh, with our, our water and our soil and the, the move to all things non-plastic. Uh, if we can do anything, it's centered around those those three things. I think those are all very important things. Thank you for that. Entrepreneurship is a marathon, not a sprint. So take care of yourself every day. Thank you for your time, Eric.